This is a test of the Bounty Park Alert System. Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the Boundary Park Alert System with me, Matt Dean. This week we are talking with the host or the co-host of the Price of Football podcast, also author of a book of the same name. It's Kieran Maguire. He is a lecturer at Liverpool University and he's an expert on football finance. Myself, Steve and Adam from Push the Boundary had a chat with him on Tuesday about some of the particulars in the finances at Oldham Athletic and also some of the financial issues that affect football as a whole at the moment. But first up, you'll be hearing a chat with me and Will and Danny from Push to Boundary. We caught up just after the victory against Hampton and Richmond Borough on Sunday, and we had a chat about that and what else has been going on during the week at Latix. (laughs) All right, all right. We just watched the Hampton and Richmond Borough victory in the Cup and we beat Cheltenham on Tuesday. So this is the first time that we're recording a podcast off the back of back-to-back wins. Just quick, quickly chat about the, the FA Cup match because we've all just watched it while it's fresh in our heads. It was nice to watch it on BT this afternoon and get multiple camera camera angles and you know close-ups of players' faces and impartial commentary as well. It was nice. I don't know which platform you watched it on, lads, but it was nice to to watch it on a different platform today. I was on BBC today. What did they make of the performance from Oldham? It's just nice looking at it from a different point of view, isn't it? I mean, I think we all know that today we made relatively hard work of it. We, we Some decent bits of quality that just made the difference today, but it wasn't exactly convincing, was it? So that, that was certainly the the feedback from the BT commentary today. You know, they they were more impressed with with Hampton and, and they thought that we just had a few flashes of quality that won us the game and think that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, the, the rhetoric that the BBC went with was that they, they thought that Hampton give us a really good go. And I, sp- I suppose that's what the FA Cup's all about, isn't it? The the underdog giving the uh, a Football League side or a Football League side giving a Premier League side a, a good run for the money. And I thought Hampton certainly did that today, to be fair. Like I said, a, a couple of flashes of quality and then... Danny Rowe in the post late on, which was a fantastic effort, would have obviously put it to bed. But it was a, it, it was, a, it was quite enjoyable to watch. To be fair, I thought it was a really good cup tie, and thankfully we've we've come out the the right end of it and into the draw tomorrow. Got a bit nervous towards the end, you know, a one goal lead. Like the the BBC commentators were saying that they could see that Harry Kuehl wasn't comfortable with a with a one goal lead. So when we scored the third, you could see that Kuehl relaxed a bit, but. You know, at two one, at three two, he was he was looking a bit nervous. We're we're all long enough in the tooth and, and supported Oldham long enough to know that three one is not a good lead for Oldham, is it? Like four one or five one, you might start getting comfortable, but like, and then it gets to three two. Um, and I I'm not one who generally bites my nails, but I noticed like towards the end of the game that me. My fingers were in my mouth, and I was chomping a little bit on my fingernails. Because and, and then they went that 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 uh, shout for a penalty at the end when the lad dived. Because you just don't, off the first instance, you just don't know, do you? Are, are you thinking, oh god, here we go. Well, yeah, I thought it looked like a penalty from obviously the camera angle. It did, and with all the bodies in the box, it, the referees done really well there. Yeah, and to be fair, we got away with one, didn't we, earlier on. So sometimes they even it up a bit, don't they? But he couldn't really even that one up, could he? It was blatant dive. Uh, they had a penalty last time we played, didn't they? And that was a dive, if I remember rightly. I think he got retrospectively banned. Well, that was um, Miller Rodney, wasn't it, who got sent off today? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I noticed on, on Twitter, Latics fans don't forget these things, do they? <laughs> you can see they're carrying the vitriol forward a couple of years. But I thought the referee had a, had a good game today. I thought it... It had a good feel to it. It was a good cup tie. If if I wasn't an Oldham fan, I would have been rooted on Hampton, and I would have thought that they, that they had a chance. So it was yeah, it was a good, it was a good cup tie. You won, you move on. That's it, isn't it? That's all. That's all it is now. We're in the next round. It's a nice little learner for the club. So it's all positive. Danny Raw showed why he needs to start games because he can make chances out of anything, can't he? Bahambula, I thought today, obviously a good cross for that goal, but. 
frustrating player in terms of his end product. He gets on the ball, he drives with it, he doesn't do enough. At, at the end of it, he doesn't get enough shots on target and, and, and enough crosses, does he? I really thought at the beginning of that game, I thought Bahambu is going to score a couple of, of goals here today. He's going to burst through it, you know. So I was a little bit frustrated, not to slag him off too much, but I just think he needs to work on his end product a bit. I was I was saying to the lads um, that you know today was was the day that he was gonna gonna score if, if try and get him on the score sheet get him up and running because he does a lot of a lot of decent stuff he, he plays a lot of decent balls it's just like like a lot of the rest of the team he's just inconsistent yeah like like Grant today uh, that cross for the first was really well worked it was brilliant but then later on in the game he's you know, passing the ball and dribbling it in front of him for and giving it away. It is where we are, though, isn't it? At this level, that's that's what you get, unfortunately. He definitely looks a lot better out on the left-hand side, though, doesn't he? That's that's mm. where he needs to be. He's got, he has got a good left foot. There's no doubt about it. He takes a good dead ball. He's got a good delivery. We have to give some credit to Dylan Fage. He could, gets a lot of stick, but great run. Great ball from McCalmont, just hooking it over and out on the break. So, yeah, some good good stuff. Uh, we won. We're through. Obviously, enter Doncaster in the next round jokes, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And uh, we move on. I think that the more impressive result of the week is definitely the win against Cheltenham. We are, we've are we got a, a chat coming up with Kieran Maguire, the football finance expert, and uh, in the next part of this podcast, we booked that chat with him at six o'clock on Tuesday, all of us overlooking the fact that that's it, we're kicking off at six o'clock against Cheltenham. So I didn't see the game, but Danny, you watched it. They had plenty of the ball, Cheltenham, but we, we sat in well and, and looked decent on the counter, a bit like today, really, that we, we always look like we've got goals in us. Uh, when they went 1-0 up, I thought, here we go again at home. Uh, we equalised not long after, and then second half, they applied a bit of pressure late on. Lawler made a great save. They had one cleared off the line, and we uh, obviously scored off a corner that, by the way, so, uh, Danny Rowe was absolutely fantastic in that. He uh, raced all the way across the pitch, uh, hunted the ball down, and won a corner out of basically nothing. It was a lost, lost cause, really. We scored off that, which was a... A really nice result to get, certainly in midweek. And we seem to be quite good on Tuesday nights, to be fair. Well, we've got Bradford this Tuesday in the EFL Trophy, so that's a something and nothing game. Presumably some of the other lads will get a run out that haven't played uh, much this season. I mean, Danny Rowe has to play now, doesn't he? I mean, Dernley's injured, uh, McElhaney's injured. So they're the other two centre-forwards that we've got. So he has to play Rowe. Yeah, and you know, got a good 90 out of him today. People saying that he, he's, he's not fit enough for 90 minutes. He did all right today, going right to the end, cracking shot off the post. Yeah, yeah I, I don't see any problem starting starting him. No, no. fitness problem. You always there. feel like something's going to happen when Danny Rowe gets the ball, don't you, really? Like, the, the way that he took it, the, the goal, that our third oh, goal brilliant. Was, was fantastic. The two Hampton players are still queuing for a hot dog and a bovril right now, aren't they, really? <laughs> Yeah, it was great, wasn't it? That composure, that's what it's all about in it, in, in the box. And that's where you get your goals from. It's either instinctiveness that, that gets your goals or composure in it. And, and that's what it was all about with Raw today. Pure composure, pure, pure classic for that finish. Uh, yeah, happy back to back wins. I think the thing is now is we've got Scunthorpe on Saturday coming up. Massive, massive game. If we can win that, um, puts them more in trouble, pulls us away from the, from the mire. Another six pointer in November. Yeah. Are, are you growing in confidence as the week goes by performance wise, do you think? Or, you know, as we as we get more wins in the bag, we've got three league wins now and then we've got the cup win today. Does it, how are you feeling? It, it's a difficult one. Just with the inconsistencies over the pitch, we're leaking goals and injuries and, and coronavirus isolations and things. We don't, we don't have all the t- players at our disposal. So it, it's hit and miss, isn't it? Yeah. Tuesday night certainly settled me down a, a, quite a lot. Give me belief that we could actually beat teams that, whether they're in and in, in around the top five or six, that to get them three points was was massive, really. And then, like I said, Scunthorpe coming up next Saturday is a massive opportunity to to get another three points and pull further away, and maybe even get to look into obviously like mid table and and looking at the fixtures for like late November, December. Quite a lot of games. Like Will said about the the squad and the, the coronavirus, like we're missing Hamer and uh, Lawrence Bilbo today. Uh, the club confirmed, and Pierre is out self isolating, so it'll be a test of the squad certainly. Yeah, we'll talk about Wheater in a minute because <laughs> there's always, as always, there's an update on on that front. But I think, I mean, I know it's a very early to to condemn a club to relegation, but 
South End are going to be having all those things that we've talked about. I, I think they're gone. I think they're as good as gone already. I know it's very, very early, but I can't see South End getting out of this, to be honest. The other thing as well is is the threat of administration and points deductions, which there are clubs, you know, like Latics and, and in and around the bottom of the division that could potentially fall foul to that. So it's it's not straightforward, is it? The end, you know, this season and how it might end up. I think it, so far we've been looking in so far as we've we've beaten Bolton, we've beaten Southend, teams are better down there. If we can do the same against Scunthorpe, then then I think everyone will be will be much more comfortable. But there's always the chance that we'll lose <laughs> as well. So then we feel completely different, don't we? Definitely. Yeah. Southend are in a really bad way. Yeah. Losing yesterday as well in penalties to Boreham Wood. Yeah. When, when, a, when a team's on a, on a run like that, when you've got problems behind the scenes... Yeah, they don't have much going for them, do they? Unfortunately yeah. for them, they, it looks like this is the time that, that they that they lose. I mean, Mansfield are down there, aren't they? They've just uh, appointed Nigel Clough as their manager, which is a good signing for them. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a long, hard season. There's no doubt about that. Kind of season that you need your that you, you need your experience. Pros playing on a regular basis, isn't it? Really, segue into David Wheater. The club put out a, a statement, lads. What did you make of it? <laughs> it's, 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 not what, it's not what we made of it it's what all the fans made of it did you see well, you're all you're all the fans to it? i did see the response to it yeah yeah it's <sighs> baffling coming, come, baffling coming coming out with that after they've already said that he's not in the first team plans kind of like hints that oh he's injured that's why he's not playing if he's not in the first team plans stick to your guns and say that's that's the reason why yeah, the club's still going to get pelters if they come out and say that because all the fans want him playing. But at least they're being honest about it and not trying to drag a player's name through the mud. You know, inverted commas, lifted his dog. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, what's that all about? That's not a professional football team putting a statement like that out. Is that something that we said to the club? Did they make it up? It seems like a bit of a weird one. Even if he did do something like that, it's kind of like, well... They're saying, oh, he's making up excuses now, isn't it? That's kind of because that's how it feels because that just doesn't feel genuine, does it? But like, it was almost like they've forgotten that they put out that initial statement when it came to the fact that they've comprehensively said these two players won't be part of the first team squad, uh, which was clearly nothing to do with injuries or anything else. Well, maybe maybe it was before Cal's time that they they put the statement out about him no longer being in the first team plans because uh, I believe he he wrote the statement probably. There was quite a lot of holes to pick at in the, within there. They, they t- said in this statement that David Wheater was selective with facts that he puts out on social media and then go on to say that he got David Wheater got injured in a fixture without saying that it was a youth team game that he'd been asked or forced to play in. Yeah, so like, why is he there in the first place? Yeah, yeah. then, the, then there was the infamous dog injury and then there was the, the bit at the end about him moving house. So if you went off somewhere like Middlesbrough, where he came through at, if you went off there, then it's about, well, 200-mile round trip, 100 miles each way. And then we've had players that have lived, played for Oldham and lived in Birmingham previously, no doubt well, about it. And um, that, that's equidistant. So there's absolutely no no reason why that should have been placed in, in the statement, for, certainly for me anyway. I, I just think that... His response on Twitter that he's, he's desperate to still play for Oldham and wants to play for Oldham. When we've got five players on the bench today instead of seven, then the question is raised again. And especially when Kyle Jameson got, gets almost knocked out from having the the, uh, the absolute thunderbolt at him early in the, fir- uh, in the first half. And then you're thinking, there's certainly a place for him in the squad, for, certainly for me anyway. I mean, the whole, the whole 200-mile round trip thing is ridiculous. Like you say... Players live all over. They don't play for their local club. They have houses and they either travel to training on a daily basis. They have weekly digs. They stay with another player through the week. So they're not traveling all the time. And a 200 mile round trip isn't isn't a ridiculous amount to travel either. The other point about that is with with the moving house thing is that I think that happened while all this has been going on. Yeah, at the club. After, so it's not like, it, yeah. So it's not like he's been he told just... he's not in the first team plans. <laughs> exactly. He's, okay. Well, I'm exactly. 
I'll put my family first. Yeah, so you can't blame me for that. And at the end of the day, like you said, it's got nothing to do with with anything. Uh, it just it's just another example of, oh, well, we've said we're going to communicate with fans now, so we'll have to put something out, and that'll be good enough. Well, it's not. And Oldham fans have, <laughs> you've, they've got great memories. And another thing that's come out this week is that timeline, which is really good. Uh, again, someone's spent some time putting together things that have happened over the over the last few years since uh, Abdallah's been in charge. And people don't forget, do they? So you yeah. can't just come out with stuff like that, um, or this will do. <laughs> it won't do, unfortunately. The, the and you're only part, making things worse. The worst part about that timeline is I was reading it you know, when when it came out, and I'd, I'd actually forgotten half the stuff that had gone on. Yeah, well, yeah. there's so much. There's so much. It's like, like Trump, he's gone this this time, thank God. But... Like, you know, if you throw enough shit, then it's not that it, it, some of it sticks. It's just that you just get lost in all the shit, don't you? So, And, and there's been criticism for him putting that together and saying, well, what, you know, it, it's all very negative. There's no balance. So when people are challenged in, okay, well, what, what positives can we put on this timeline? And the, the only thing that people can come up with is, oh, we've still got a football club. Yeah. Ask, ask, ask Bury and Macclesfield and stuff. But you can't put that on a timeline. Just because you've got a football club doesn't mean that it's being run the right way. No, there's and and look at the end of the day, if, yeah, they're all negative, but there's a lot of negative things to talk about, and that's the point, isn't it? That's the point of it, and there isn't a lot of positive things to talk about. You know, look at Richie Wellens this week has gone to Salford, an in-demand manager, that, drop down a division as well. Yeah, drop down the division because they want him, and he'll be getting good money there now at Salford. And obviously, being in charge at Salford comes with its own perils. I guess they're they're not going to be very patient with him, and they're they're expecting a lot from him. But he was the manager when they took over, played some of the best best stuff we've played in years under Richie Williams. All right, we went down, and I know that this kind of divides opinion, but I said it at the time. If we'd have stuck with him and they'd have just let him get on with it, I think he would have brought us straight back up again if they hadn't have interfered. So it's just little things like that that just yeah. that niggle. I mean, it, like you say, you know, you don't know how long he'll last at Salford. You think, well, if, if they do sack him, they're not going to sack him by text while he's on holiday, <laughs> no. like we did. You'd think not, wouldn't you? There's plenty to, to bring up. And, and it's good that it's been put down on paper like that so that we can read it and so that it can be presented to people and say, look, well, this, just, this is just the way it is. You can counter these things if you want, but I think by all accounts, it's pretty accurate. And it's and it's good to to show why why the fans are feeling like they do. Carl's been quite vocal on on Twitter recently, and he's he's, he's feeling the brunt of a lot of negativity from the fans. And a lot of people are saying, "Well, have a look at this timeline. Have a have a look and see why the fans are feeling like they are." Because it's it's all there. There's so many points that the club have done badly that. The fans are just fed up with it. I think on that point as well, Will, which is, is is relevant now in terms of Carl and the statement that came out, you know, Carl's job and the reason Carl's here is to try and stop these things from happening, to change it around, to be responsible for the club's PR communication. And so for that to come out under Carl, I think he's very disappointing for us all. Um, you know, we've all spoken to Carl. You know, he's, he's an easy guy to talk to, seems like a nice guy. Um, but it is disappointing that that has come out under Carl and that he may have even written it. Do you know what I mean? I'm a bit I'm a bit disappointed by that. How do you feel? I, I was disappointed by the statement, personally. I, I just looked and I thought, oh no, not again. Things need to change fundamentally, really. If Abdel is still going to be here in another three years, then we can't have another timeline as as uh, filled with as much as the previous three years mm. happening for the next three years because one will either not have a club not have a club in the football league to support or two you'll have we'll, we'll be playing football in front of minimal support because fans will just get so tired and of, of the uh, the tedious nature of how and, and the manner of how the football clubs run the other thing that came out this week was the Hummel kit <laughs> choice thing for next season uh i'd like to thank uh, emily watson aged four from failsworth who uh sent in the drawings of the kits uh from hummel uh she did a really good job god bless her like it wasn't i mean i and i, and I noticed that there were some snidey comments on there from uh some oldham staff on that thread uh what name any names but like there were some comments on there 
that people were people were challenging it and saying, look, this is all a bit amateur hour, this. We're not, I mean, I, I retweeted it and said something along the lines of, Hummel have said that the kits are going to have patterns. However, they're not repealing the pattern, revealing the patterns. So what are we actually voting for here? Because it was just blue top, you know what I mean? White shorts, blue socks, and then some patterns which may or may not be like the ones represented in the picture. It wasn't really anything, and, you know. And then a Latix fan put something out with like a concept kit, which was really good in terms of it's the way it was designed and how it looked. And we got these really crappy little drawings from Hummel. That was really disappointing, wasn't it? Because they, they weren't really consulting fans on anything. It was like... It's all that you can expect these days with kit manufacturers. That they, they all go off templates and they're all going to look the same and it'll probably be the same as, as other clubs. And that's the kind of choice that you're going to get these days. That's fair enough, but... The, the actual drawings that were, you know what I mean? The graphics were so naff. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are you voting for there? Like, they all look, they, they all look crap. So, you know, yeah, it just, it just seemed like a very, very kind of disappointing attempt at fan engagement from yeah. Hummel and from, from the club, really. It is, like you say, when, when you've got a fan there that's, that's done a concept kit, and we've seen them years and years and years, fans come up with concept kits that a lot of them look so good. And you can think it can't be that hard to, to put these these kits together and and run them for a season. And, and Carl responded saying, "Oh well, you know, no one's come up with any concepts that I've seen since he's been talking about the kits." Well, they didn't ask us to though, did they? Didn't ask, they didn't said. ask anyone. Why, if, we, if, what, yeah, what, lads, why don't you throw your ideas in? You know. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I've not seen the kits. I've not. I, I saw the post. I've, I've not been on it. I'll get Emily uh, to send you some over from uh, Emily. <laughs> I, I mean, to, to me, uh, like I said, it's all the fan engagement, which is absolutely fine. It'd be a really good idea if the club was in the right place and, the, and run in the, in the right way. But for me, the, there's bigger things than voting on a kit for next year. That's yeah, I mean, me we've, yeah, no, I'm, and it, it seems not. a bit weird because we've only just started this season. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not what we. How many games are we in? It's a bit early doors. And then there's the badge as well, which now is the, the, the new badge. You know, we're going to be getting a new badge, which is hopefully going to be an old badge. But now I've got visions of badges coming in from four-year-olds in crayon that we're going to have to that we're going to have to judge on. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like you're being overly critical, don't you? Like you feel like you're sniping at everything. But I think in the in the modern era, and you look at what 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 clubs are doing and how well they're doing things and how professional they are, sometimes it just gets a little bit disheartening that I mean, like in credit to whoever it was who made that video before the FA Cup tie this morning, we you know with the the, the the reels of I mean, just how good was Ricky Old crossing a football, yeah. for God's sake. I mean that you know. that that video, like you said, Matt, was absolutely tremendous and like it's spine tingling really the the the, the memories. I mean uh, for for me, with the like the two Liverpool games, the the uh, Gary McDonald winner at Everton, the Fulham uh, Jose Baxter free kick at Forest. The FA Cup is brilliant. You know, it's it's a fantastic competition, and you know, I was lucky to have been at a lot of those games that were on there today. Going back to that Ricky Olden cross and Roger Palmer's ever, uh, header against Everton at Boundary Park, I was there, and you know, loads of those games going back years now that are just. Part of what the, the especially when you're struggling in the league, those moments are, are magic, aren't yeah. they? You know, and to see Boundary Park full, and we don't want to be like reminiscing about the good times all the time, but it's nice to remember that. Oh, definitely. That, that, that that's what's possible, and that's what yeah. Boundary Park can be like. And away, I mean, it's away, one, one, of, one of my one of my biggest regrets is not going to Forest away. I'm so gutted I missed that match. I oh, didn't miss that much. Well, no. It oh was, no, it wasn't, no. That, it wasn't that brilliant, honestly. That was it. Was his. And, and it's <laughs> yeah. You, you look at and that's probably one of the ones that gave me the most goosebumps watching that video. You know Baxter's free kick and just thinking about that picture of him, like sliding up to the the stand and just all the fans behind. It's, yeah. a, it's just a brilliant image. That I tell you what, I I'd, I'd not seen that Gary McDonald goal for a, for a long time, and that gave me a proper flashback because being underneath the stand at Everton, where because on the bottom tier you can't really see the rest of the stadium. You can just kind of see the pitch, but. The noise for the whole game that that, that Latics fans made, it was just tremendous. We sang all all the way through the game. Five and a half thousand fans. Yeah, really, really amazing. And then it's such a brilliant goal from from McDonald as well. Such a brilliant strike. It was really, really good. I'd not I'd not gone back to that memory for quite a long time and it was buzzing. It really was. I missed the goal. (laughs) Did you? 
<laughs> well, I, was down, I was down on the concourse getting uh, getting some beers. You didn't miss the noise though, did you? Oh God, no! <laughs> and listening again, listening to the um the video when that goal went in, and you can just hear the crowd cheering, and it was like a like a home team scoring. Yeah, the noise was that loud. Yeah, and again, we were we were just fantastic. We just made so much noise. We were just when Oldham fans have got a bit between the teeth like that, when they believe in the team and they believe in themselves and they come together in numbers like that, then we are just we're, we're amongst the best traveling fans in the country. There's no doubt about that, and. It was nice that the club put that out today and it was nice that it gives you that response and I think it's important that we don't just snipe at the uh, at the bad things. Mm. But it would be nice if there was more of those good things to come out, wouldn't it? That's it. We don't want to pick bits out. I want it all to be good. And it's not. It's never always all going to be good. But, like, you know, it's football, so it's it's ups and downs. But you can be the club can be consistently good in how it performs. The team can't always be consistently good in how they perform. Do you know what I mean? There's a difference. Yeah. And that's what we need to get to. That's what, we, that's what we've been so upset about in recent times is that the club haven't been performing well and the club team haven't been performing well. So it's a double whammy. So fair play uh, to whoever made that video, Athletics. It was really good. I really enjoyed that. We've got a chat coming up now with Kieran Maguire, who's a football finance expert, who chatted with myself and Steve and Adam earlier on in the week. These games are massive for us, aren't they? I think it was 17 grand that we got from today's victory. You know, we need this cup run, don't we? The club needs this cup run in this year more than yeah. ever. Even if we lose the next round, it's eight and a half grand to the loser. And it's about 25 and a half grand for the winner for the next round. So it's it's good money. Yeah. Well, I think we'll move on to the chat with Kieran and we can talk a bit more about football finance and what that means at Boundary Park and what it means to the game as a whole. You know, it's a serious topic, football finance, and I think fans like us who are at Oldham and increasingly a lot of other fans at other clubs are, are, are tuning in now because it's just so relevant. And so we're talking about it more than we're talking about football, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and that's that, that's a tragedy because when, when we fell in love with the game, you know, when, when, you know, you're probably seven, eight, nine years old and you went along to that first match with you know the floodlights, the smell of the burgers, the noise of the crowd, that's what we all committed to in terms of football. Sadly, all of these tragic stories, you know, Berry's not too far away, Macclesfield's not too far away. We know that, uh, you know, Oldham have clearly issues as far as the management are concerned. And, and somebody's got to try and hold, hold a light up to the clubs. And, you know, clearly you guys are trying to do it, push the boundary. And I've met Many other fans groups, you know, the, the, the not a penny more guys at Blackpool who did an amazing job to get rid of their owner, um, and we we had something similar at Brighton. Obviously, Project in the Picture was was sort of seemed to just come out of nowhere, didn't it, a few weeks ago? And I just wondered where where exactly are we at with Project Big Picture at the moment? Is it dead, or is it is it sort of does it need a shovel taken to it, or you know where where are we at with it? Um, it it's not dead. It was uh, a first try to see what the reaction would be. It, it's it's been in fruition. They've been working on it for bold accounts for three years, so they're, they're not they're not going to let go. And the fact that, by all accounts, Richard Masters, who's the who's the chair of the Premier League, that he's been in meetings with the big six or wh- whatever they want to call them. I, I hate that phrase, but. If we say it, we know what we're talking about. We know the club's involved. He's been involved with meetings with them since the the story was leaked. Um, And there's a hell of a lot of politics in football, in football administration and governance. Certainly some of the issues are going to come back. Uh, I think they were surprised, uh, the, the architects of it, the sort of the coordinated response by football fans. The fact that you've got... You know, Spirit of Shankly and the Manchester United Independent Supporters Group and, and Arsenal and Spurs. And, you know, all, all of the big six fan groups pushed back on it. Uh, and I, I know it was sold to the, the EFL clubs as a huge positive, but I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to, to have been sent a copy of the full document and it goes on and on and on. And the more you look into it, the more dangerous it becomes, I think, for clubs in the EFL. So everybody's 
heard, oh, it's it's 250 million quid and 25 percent of the TV deal. And you go, wow, that sounds like free money. But then the 250 million quid turns out to be in advance. So it's effectively it's a payday loan. Now, do clubs need money now? Yes, they do. So you can understand why the club's saying, well, you know, sod this. Yeah, we, we just, just give us the money and we'll worry about things afterwards. And then 25 percent of the TV deal. But again, as soon as you start to dig in, each club in the Premier League would be able to stream eight matches a season for international rights. So if you're Liverpool or Manchester United, are they going to be streaming their home fixtures against Fulham, Burnley, Palace, Brighton? Or, well, can you imagine the streaming figures they would get for Liverpool versus Manchester United, Liverpool versus Chelsea? So you're getting 25% of a much smaller pie and also, presently, the eight clubs in the EFL, they get all of the EFL TV deal. Well, the EFL TV deal gets added to the Premier League TV deal, and you get 25% of what you used to get, 100%. So, and also the fact that two, F, two, two EFL clubs are going to disappear. There, 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 were a, there were a few nuggets of good things in it, but they, in my opinion, they were few and far between. And as for people saying that, that handing across all of the power in English football to uh, Joel Glazer. Has, has, he, has he ever been to Boundary Park? I would imagine not. I would imagine not. No, no. Uh, John Henry. I don't, I don't think I've seen him with a Latix scarf on or, or you know, no. sne- 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 sneaking for a dodgy burger before a match. To hand all of the power in English football to these people who don't understand the, the culture of fandom I think is incredibly dangerous. They want the best of the US sports system, which is closed leagues, guaranteed income streams, and the best of what we've got here in Europe, which is the bigger clubs keep more of the money. So yeah, that's that's how they see football going forwards. And I think that they will they will get more and more of what they've set out to achieve over the course of the next few years. You did an interview the other day where you'd commented about Wigan winning the FA Cup and Leicester winning the Premier League and those times would be pretty much dead. And I just think when things like that are being said, it just goes to show how much, in a, in a reality, the top six really just want all control, don't they? They don't want anyone else to have a chance of breaking that top six down. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you entirely, Adam. Uh, if you think about it, since the creation of the Premier League in 1992, 49 clubs have been in the Premier League. And even if it's only for a season or two, it's still a great experience. And, uh, you know, you do get those lifelong memories. The the proposals will probably ensure that that 49 clubs doesn't become, certainly doesn't become 60. I suspect it wouldn't become more than 52 or 53. Such will be the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, And I think it, it takes away hope. And one of the things which I thought was, was most disgusting that, it, that it, this was revenge on Leicester City. Because if you take a look at the nine clubs who had, would be given these enhanced voting rights, Leicester City wasn't one of those clubs. But Leicester City has won the Premier League more recently than Manchester United, Arsenal, Spurs, West Ham, Everton and Newcastle. So it's it's won the Premier League more recently than than six out of the nine. But because in 2016, they had the bare-faced cheek to be the best football club in in the country, to win matches on the pitch. And and this is is what these guys don't want to do, because when when they get their way, it will be by whatever happens to the Champions League in 2024. They want it to be through it by, by invitation only. We've already seen comments from the likes of Agnelli. At Jack Juve, who who is moaning about you know, who's ever heard of Atalanta? Well, I've heard of Atalanta because they're in the Champions League on merit. Mm. Well, what they're trying to do, it's like they're, it's moving more to like a corp. It's like like business, where you're you're eradicating competition, which is what you do in business. But football yeah. isn't just a business; it's a sport. So competition is essential to everyone's enjoyment of that sport. The entertainment industry, isn't it? But it is, but it's a sporting competition. There has to be an element of competition. You have to be some kind of level playing field. And obviously we've enjoyed the Premier League, but the chances of us ever getting back there now are so small. Like you said, Kieran, before about hope, it is disheartening that you feel that 
you're just on a different planet, never mind a, in a different league. I, I, I crunched a load of numbers the other day. If you take a look at the big six clubs in the Premier League, they earn, on average, three times the amount of money as clubs in the other 14. And what they're saying is that that gap isn't big enough because what they don't want is Aston Villa 7, Liverpool 2. What they don't want is Manchester United 1, Crystal Palace 3. They want to completely eradicate any opportunity for the smaller clubs. As, as you absolutely rightly said, the one thing that these owners want, because they are business people, they're not football fans, is that they want to eliminate uncertainty and, and they, want, they want certainty of, of revenue flows and, and qualification for the European competition. And one of the things that you, you, you touched on before was um, obviously the money that was being offered by Project Big Picture to, to, to lower league clubs. And I just wondered what what sort of financial assistance has been given to lower league clubs or to the you know clubs in the EFL since the pandemic. Right. Well, well what we have seen is that, that, that there are two TV deals that are in operation. First of all, there's the EFL, its own TV deal. That's worth um, £119 million a season. For a club in League Two, um, it's, it's not, not hugely uh, beneficial because clubs in League Two only get 8% to, to split between the 24 clubs. So 80% goes to uh, Championship, 12% to League One, 8% to League Two. So a, a club in League Two will get around about 400, 450 grand. What the EFL has done, and again, here, I'm all for giving credit where it's due, is that they've said, we're going to give you that cash up front because that will allow you to pay play the next two, two couple of uh, wage bills. And in addition to that, there is something called a solidarity payment. And this is a proportion of the, the Premier League TV deal itself. Um, and, and that filters down to the EFL clubs. And that's probably worth about sort of 650 grand for a club in League Two. So it's actually worth more than the EFL's own TV deal. And what the Premier League have said, well, we normally pay that to you in instalments, but we're giving it all of, to, all of that to you now because, again, we, we, we want the, the clubs to be in existence in, in the EFL. So it's going to help them in terms of cash flow. The trouble is, if you advance people money, yeah, and again, it, there is this sort of corollary with a payday loan is that it that then the gap between before your next payday becomes bigger and bigger that there's a yeah. genuine fear that some clubs might have spent both of those tv monies and when it comes to paying the the, the wages in november and december some clubs are going to be thinking we, we've got a big issue here um, yeah moving, moving more on to the last six stuff i think we contacted you in was it february February or March, I think, and it was around the time that um, we, we sort of said, would you mind taking a look at the accounts? There was, um, I think the accounts from last year, were, were they were late and they were uh, unaudited, unabridged accounts. This year, um, I think we filed them on the, the last day. And then they were revised after a, about six week period. And there was around sort of three and a half million. It was, um, you know, different from the original set of accounts that were filed. And then we contacted you again and said, you know, would you mind just sort of giving an overview? And I just, I just wondered if it, if you'd be able to, to maybe just give your thoughts, your, your views on what you, what you found from the accounts. Right. I mean, for people not, not familiar, in, in a set of accounts, you, you normally have a, a profit and loss account, which says this is the money in, this is the money out, and ideally you got more money in than coming out, and that gives you a profit. The other way around, it's a loss. In, in respect of Oldham, they, they, they don't produce their profit and loss account, which is perfectly legal. But I, I've always argued that because football clubs are so unique, you, you, are, you are all investors in Oldham Athletic Football Club. It, and and you, invest, you invest your lives. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifetime of commitment and pain and misery because that's what football is all about, as we all know. Um, and, and therefore, you deserve more than the club saying, well, legally, as a limited company, we don't have to do it, so therefore we're not going to do it. So looking at the accounts for 2019, which is, which is the most recent I've got here, now it, it looks as if the club has made a profit of around about £2 million. 
which is good. But that's really all, all we can say. Technically, the club is bust. And, and the reason why, why I say that is that it, it's got huge debts and, and its debts exceed its assets. So looking at it from a, from a cold and calculating point of view, um, the, the club is being kept going realistically by, by the commitments of its owners. Now, I understand from sort of communication that we've had that the relationship between the fan base and the owners is strained. I think it's the politest way. Uh, put it, uh, your owner appears to make uh, Mike Ashley look like Mary Poppins uh, in, in terms of the way that he's dealing dealing with things. Um, I, I don't know whether things have improved recently. I, I, I've been sort of following one or two things on Twitter. Is there a new director at the club who's trying to communicate a bit more? But the, the accounts aren't great there was a little bit of cash there clearly there was I think, the, think it was the cash figure was revised wasn't it in the previous set of accounts i think it originally said two hundred and fifty thousand. that was revised down to five thousand. yeah that 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 is that is really weird so as a as an accountant you say well some some figures are always a bit up and down you know how how much is a player worth yeah you know, if, if we're looking at if, we, if we're looking at the the stock of kit you know, should we be writing that down because it's last year's kit? You, you can argue about some things. The one thing you really can't argue about is how much money you've got in the bank account because you, <laughs> you look at your bank statement and it says X. Mm. So if, if we take a look at Oldham's accounts, and we've got two sets of accounts here for 2018. So I'm just looking at them here. And in, in one of them, it's saying that the club had cash of £262,000 uh, at the 30th of June 2018 well that that's great you know that means it's got it's got money which you can use to pay the bills over the summer and things of that nature so that sounded really good and and then they said oh no no we've uh, we we've, we've not uh, got that amount of money and it republished them and it went from that 260,000 pounds to 5931 now we can all, we can all make uh, you know if if i was to say i've I think I've got 30 quid in my wallet. It could be that I've got 40 because I've got two, two tenors and they're stuck together. Um, so you, you can make small differences. Quarter of a million quid. And that, that really calls into question the rationale of the people preparing the accounts. The accounts are unaudited. I, I, I would be pressing for them to be audited if the club itself can't get cash to within a quarter of a million pounds of a correct figure. I think one of the other things that we picked up on as well was that there was 1.9 million pounds worth of land and buildings on, on the accounts. And, you know, as far as we're aware, you know, we don't own the ground that's owned by another company and we don't own the training facility and, and we don't own any of the land around the stadium. So as far as we're aware, we're not really sure where that 1.9 million pound comes from. So, I don't know if there's any sort of circumstances where you are a tenant, but you can still include that that money in the in the accounts. If if it's on if it's on, if they are leased, then then yes, you you can actually account for them as, as if you've owned them, especially if they're on a long lease. So so that could be the case. But what it says here, um, I'm, I'm looking at these 2018 accounts. It's saying that these are at cost and also. At some point uh, between twenty between July twenty seventeen and June twenty eighteen, it's saying that the club went out and spent one point eight million pounds on new land and buildings. Now, you're you're the experts here. Could you tie in that one point eight million pounds of land or buildings purchases? Could, did I, I know that there's an issue with one of the stands? Is is that the case? Yeah, it, it, there is. Yeah, I mean that was taken out of the accounts. Last year, I think I think five million pounds sort of disappeared off the accounts, and that was due to it being it was left in the accounts, um, even though the ownership was was elsewhere. And it was I think it was purely an administrative move to take that out. So I think originally I think the accounts went from sort of nine million to around four million in the previous yep. year. I think the club tried to sort of sell that as a you know we've made five million pounds, and in reality it was it was just the fact that this this you know the ownership of the stand had been transferred out into its into right. the correct place. Yeah. So I think that accounted for that. It says here that there was a disposal of land worth, which cost just under three million. So, so yeah, I, I guess that explains why. 
but it also uh, I don't know whether it seemed to perhaps it bought it and then sold it. it it's all it, it's all very unclear. And it, to be honest, chap, it, it, it wouldn't take more than a yeah, two hour meeting with with the people senior at the club just to get some of the fans groups around the table um, over a hot pot. And I think a, a lot a lot of issues could be resolved. But the club yeah. does appear to be suspicious of fans and therefore the fans become suspicious of the club and, and when we're left where we are at present. I think that's it. I think we've been we've been in a position where, you know, I think most of the time, like you were saying before, you've got that romanticised, you know, why you get into football. You don't get into football because you, you wait for the, the end of April to see the accounts. You know, it doesn't... It doesn't it, what you may do, yeah, yeah, to be fair. But I mean, that's not why we get into the game, is it? But I think yeah. when, you, when you're in a position that we're in, and there are, there are there's so many sort of mistruths flying around that you kind of feel as though you actually look out for this sort of stuff to see if everything tallies up with with the, the mood music that's coming out of the club and, and it doesn't often marry. The other aspect of this, and this, I guess this is more of a general thing as well, is I know the director's loan is mentioned on the on the accounts was around 717,000 and that went to one point, just shy of 1.3 million. And that was in a 12 month period. I just wondered, guess it, I guess in general terms, uh, how much of a kind of a, a millstone a director's loan can be when it comes to selling a club or how much it can sort of mask other issues? It, it can actually be a good thing. If it's an interest-free loan, then it's actually better than borrowing from a bank because the bank would be charging you interest on the borrowings. And quite often what we do see is that when clubs are sold, and, and, I, and I don't know what the intentions of the present owners are. Um, Neither do I. <laughs> I suspect they don't know either. Half the time, <laughs> what what they might do is to say, "Well, we'll knock off half of that. We we just want to get rid of the club." So it, it can act in in favour. Yeah, it, it's 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 not it's not a bad thing. It, to a certain extent, it shows that the, the the club owners are willing to financially give some form of support to the club. So so that that's a positive. One other thing I did note, um, and again, you 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 might be able to explain this better than me. What One thing I thought was quite alarming was that in, in 2018, uh, Oldham Athletic had 267 employees, and that was down to 181 in 2019. So is that a case of making people redundant, or are these people part-time staff on match days? Uh, I, I, again, I, I don't know. And, and the clubs either outsourced those costs or or just had huge cutbacks in, in terms of sort of the, the provision of facilities on a match day. I think there's definitely been a reduction in the number of staff, hasn't there, over the last 12 months? I think obviously being in League Two has obviously meant that we've had to cut our cloth in relation to staffing. But even with on-field staff, we've had a quite a high turnover and there's been quite a few employment tribunals. So the ins and outs have been very high, to say the least. So it's probably not surprising that it's dropped, but it's probably a continual changeover of staff at the same time. I'm, I'm just sort of looking at sort of what, what information we do have here. Clearly, there is some form of hostility between the present ownership and the previous ownership because there's talk in the accounts here of a, a potential £882,000 tax bill as a hangover from when they acquired the club. Now, I, I, I can vaguely recall some things which I should have read in the press that uh, this is clearly being laid at the the, the, the door of, of the previous owners. I think it was due to a was it a tax? Uh, were we audited when when Simon yeah. Corney was in charge? I believe okay. I've got a feeling that may yeah. have disappeared, but don't don't quote me on that. Um, okay. I mean, the other issue that we did have was an unpaid rent and debenture that was that was on the on the club, and that's why we ended up in court in March this year. Um, right. And we'd also had a winding up petition, I think, another another winding up petition. And, and that's just money leaking out of the club because you've got to pay accountants and lawyers yeah. and court yeah. fees and all this stuff. And not, you know, it, it, to, to allow that to happen is either negligent or incompetent if, if the club does have money. I think, yeah, and I think, I think so the other thing there is only talking about fees and costs and, and stuff is that, you know, we'd had, we've, we've obviously had a turnover of managers as well in that time. You know, if you actually look at the managers that we've we've actually got rid of, you know, we've got Dino Marmory in there, we've got uh, Richie Wellens, yeah, Skulls, I think walked, Benid, he was sat. You know, I mean, Frankie surely there's, there's there's yeah, Frankie Bond. 
you know, there's severance pay in there as well, isn't there? I would assume as part of a, you know, a, a manager's contract. Yeah, I don't think the severance pay in, in the lower leagues is very good because the managers tend to be on relatively short contracts to begin with. Quite often there will be a, a clause. And, and then, and I'm not saying that this has happened at Oldham, but certainly it's something that I'm aware that has happened at other clubs. You, you might be entitled to six months severance pay if you're sacked. But then what the club will do is they will delay and delay. Now, if, if you're a manager who's just lost his job and you've got, you know, you've got a partner and a couple of kids and you've got a mortgage, the club will say, look, you know, we're not, we won't pay you this. If you, if you want the six months, we have to go to court for it. I'll tell you what we'll do. We, we'll give you two months. If you talk to people in the League Managers Association, that they know that, that some clubs, and, and I'm not saying Oldham are one of these, because I, I genuinely don't know, some clubs are have a reputation in the industry for, for really pushing things. Football is, uh, is, is, as we all know, it's a very precarious industry if you're a manager. Kieran, you're, I think you live in Trafford, do you, from what I heard on your podcast? So you live in the North West, is that right? Um, I, I, I did. I mean, I, I played for Trafford Cricket Club for 30 odd years. And then we had a bit of a midlife crisis a year ago and I've moved down to Sussex. Familiar with the uh, North West and Manchester, though, with, obviously. You know, oh, yeah. Why do you think that we're, we're struggling so much in Greater Manchester? In terms, is, is it purely Man United and Man City and, and Liverpool and Everton that, uh, that, that, that just suck all the, the money and the attention away? Or is it bad management on an individual club level? Why why is it that we've got Stockport and Bury and Macclesfield and Tranmere getting relegated out of the football league and all this stuff happening in the North West? Yeah. Wigan as well. Um, Wigan, Bolton. Yeah. yeah, this goes on. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think it's actually anything to do with the sort of the, the senior clubs. I mean, it's, it certainly is now because, because if you, if you think about London, there's all of those big clubs in the Premier League, and yet Leighton Orient, who have had a tough time, they, they still survive. Brentford are flourishing. Fulham have, have done probably. You know, is that just because it's weight. London though, and London just attracts more money and more attention and more interest? And, and is there potential for that in the northwest as, as the as the northwest economy grows? If it grows. Will it catch up? Not that it'll catch up to London, but you know, are we just are we at the? Do you think that we're maybe at just a low point, and that it could get a lot better, or is this how it's going to be? What What do you think? Unfortunately, I, I think clubs in the northwest have had the misfortune to have a series of scumbag owners. If If you take a look at uh, Al Cardi at uh, Macclesfield, he only used to get in touch with the club via WhatsApp. You've got Steve Dale. At Berry, who's a complete ass, a really horrid human being. Ken Anderson at Bolton, who was only ever interested in lining his own pocket. Uh, you know, but this, this is a guy that had been banned from being a director for eight years. And, you know, he was saying, well, I've never paid myself a penny in wages since coming to the club. And he's, yes, yes, that's true. But again, you know, when, when you're a nosy sod like I am, you, you go and find out that he was paying himself hundreds of thousand pounds in consultancy fees. So, yeah, it wasn't a wage. Don't get me started on oh, in Oyster <laughs> or at Blackpool. You know, and yeah. so it, it comes down to individuals. There, there have been clubs down south. If you look at Portsmouth, they went through a succession of scumbag owners. We've certainly had some here at Brighton. At Orient, they have had problems with previous owners. Talk to a South End fan about their owner who's trying to shift Roots Hall to effectively to, to sell it because he wants to he wants to build properties there. You know, the, I think it's just been unfortunate in the Northwest that it is it's it's, it's a hotbed of football. Um, so definitely there are more clubs to begin with. You know, Tranmere have had had problems. They those problems are now being sorted. They've now got some of the best owners in in, in Mark and Nicola Palos that, that yeah. any club could hope for. And I think there's some great owners in the Northwest. I'm sure you're aware of Andy Holt at Accrington. He's, and even owners who we used to think were utterly shite aren't quite as bad as we thought. I, I do quite a lot of work with Blackburn fans. It's taken five years, but, well, OK, every year the Venkis are putting in seven or eight million pounds into that club from India. And, and they just write out those checks. I, I, think, I think it's just been a, a series of unfortunate events. Uh, in the sense that the clubs have been transferred to owners who, frankly, you wouldn't want to, uh, you, know, you, you wouldn't want to have them knocking on your door, offering you a newspaper, let alone running your football club. 
which opens I mean, up a lot of questions about the EFL and governance and lots of other issues that we haven't got time to go into right now. But yeah, it's concerning, but it's also hopeful that it can be rectified yes. and we've, we've got yeah. a more positive future as a region. You, 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 get, you get a new owner coming in and if they align with the fans in the sense that they see themselves as custodians rather than owners, they communicate and they communicate two ways rather than just sending off, sending off pompous you know, chairman's notes uh, that they, they genuinely communicate and, and they, they realise just how embedded Oldham Athletic is to the local community, then that relationship can turn around instantly because what you, what you will find, I would say, 99.9% of the time is that if there is a new owner, the first thing that the fans do is that they give them the benefit of the doubt. They, they show them a degree of goodwill if they believe that they're genuine. And, and sometimes they're not. Just got to look to see what's happened at Charlton uh, with, with a series of clowns that have run that club over the course of the last 12 months. But the new guy that's come in, Thomas Sanderson, yeah, OK, he, he is very rock and roll, but he... He seems to have worked it out and, and he's done all the right things. He's, he's put money into a bank account, which he can't touch as a guarantee of good faith. He has been in communication with the fan base and, and things of this nature. So it, it can work. Following the pandemic, do you think that footballers learn anything and, and about how it needs to go forward? On the face of it, I would say, personally, it doesn't really feel like it has. You're giving this money to potentially unscrupulous owners that's not dealing with the root cause of the problem is it you're just giving somebody who's already bad with money more money you know you need to be dealing with the, the actual issue itself and i just wondered if we if, if we've learned anything from from that um no no um the, the two reasons first of all football is is an industry with notoriously short memory it, it, it's not a business that that tends to learn from its mistakes and, and the, the example i would give to you Let's go back to 2002, 2003 with ITV Digital. We had all this extra money was coming in. Then ITV Digital collapsed within a year. The clubs in the EFL were hit really hard. You would have thought that they would have learned their lessons there. But we, as we've seen over the course of events, you know, certainly over the last 12 to 18 months, we, we started talking about the podcast that I do. In an ideal world, that podcast would die on its ass because there would be no scumbag stories for us to be discussing all the time. The fact that I'm now having to do two shows an hour an hour a time when we started off doing 20, well, 20 minutes will be enough once a week it, it is a sign of bad news, I think. You know? And if, if I'm never seen on, on a screen again or on a podcast again, that would be absolutely fantastic for football. I'm the Grim Reaper. You wouldn't be talking to me if things were good at Oldham, would you? No, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think in terms of has football learned anything, you know, maybe the people who were responsible for the finances of football clubs, maybe they aren't learning. I think the the, the wider web of football fans of, of, of you know, yeah, like you said, Kira, you pop, pop on all sorts. I've just listened to the um, Out of Our League Berry podcast in, um, over the last couple of days, and you, you were on there. And what's brilliant these days is that we're able to share information share experiences share stories you know and like what the lads that push the boundary have done has been brilliant because they're representing all the fans but they're also reaching out to fans of all of the clubs all over the country that have been through similar experiences and i think we are learning as yeah. fans we're learning and and hopefully we can start applying that 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 knowledge so that we can put pressure on football on the government on all these people in future so that whatever happens next to autumn athletic is not just a replica of what's just happened at Oldham Athletic. And that's the really important message, I think. I, 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 I'm always trying to be positive, and I genuinely hope that is the case. My concern is that the distance between the people in charge of the game and the fans is growing all the time. You've only got to look at the performance of Greg Clark. If anybody's ever seen uh, the stuff he came out with when there was the, the Common Select Committee in investigation, into what happened at Bury, where he effectively said, "Well, I wasn't even aware there was a problem at Bury mm. until six weeks ago." And I'm going, "Well, what what planet are you on?" That they, they get so used to dealing with people at that level that they don't realise that we as fans are living and breathing football clubs seven days a week. And, and if a club goes to the wall, well, hold it. Yeah, look at Manchester United's new away kit that will fill the newspapers. Was there a fuss when Macclesfield went bust? No. And I look at the BBC app and 
it's prioritising news about the Champions League and this, that and the other over big stories that are involved in EFL clubs, yeah. uh, really important issues that, that, that should be coming up on on that app in my face saying this is really, really important. And and they just it's been pushed aside over over the other stuff, over the, the frills and yeah, it's really disheartening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, you, you look at the number of times that the BBC website will lead with a Manchester United story. You know, Paul Pogba's new haircut. Uh, you know, this is this is not journalism, but yeah. it, it delivers eyeballs. So you, know, you you can't blame the broadcasters for saying. Well, if we know that a Manchester United story is going to get lots of attention, then we're under pressure to deliver the big story. I, I, th- I, th- I thought that Macclesfield Town was a huge story over the course of the summer. A cynic would say that the constant points deduction from the EFL, what the EF, you know, a lot of people have said what the EFL's attention was, that Macclesfield would have been a much bigger story had they been part of the 92. So let's get them out of the EFL. And the National League hadn't really adopted them so they sort of fell between the, the cracks uh, um, one of the one of the things that um Macclesfield really struggled with was the was the points deductions wasn't it for well late payment of wages and then the non you know not not fulfilling the fixtures and I just wondered if they'd been because there was talk of points deductions being brought in weren't there for for late payment or non-payment of wages and I wondered if there'd been any development on that within the AFL there's there's nothing that's been agreed, and remember, all dis- ultimately, all re- rule changes are based on votes, and, and the votes come from the club club owners. Now, can you see it from a club owner's point of view? Um, mm. They know well. You know, we, we, there's been a couple of occasions when we've struggled to pay the wages. The last thing we want to do is to end up with automatic points deductions on that basis. And, and, and my my reaction as a football fan is that. It's the fans that lose out as a result of these decisions. Um, it should be the owners who are being punished, if, if anything. So, I, I'm from a from a conceptual point of view, I'm, I'm not happy with it. Um, have, have, there, have there been issues in terms of Oldham and wages this, over the last twelve months? There's certainly been stories. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think there was there was reports that I think we we paid late wages. I think every month from uh, it might have been December up to the up to lockdown essentially. Yeah. Um, so there was four months there, and then there was rumours of sort of late payment. I mean, one of the things that was mentioned was that when questioned on this was that we had a we had a we didn't have a pay day at the club. We had a pay period. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was bizarre. <laughs> and it's something that we've I think we did a bit of research and we, we've never heard of that before we actually spoke to the CEO last night and he, he didn't seem too sure that that um, that was the case um, but yeah it just seemed it just seemed a bit of a deflection tactic really yeah that, 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 that that's absolutely not I mean, tr- try that the next time you go to Tesco's uh, you know buy, buy your groceries and, and they say well yeah it's it's 55 quid well um, there's a pay period for this somewhere within the next two or three weeks i'll give you the cash just just see just see how you get on as they as they phone as they phone 999 kieran i yeah. haven't read your book yet the price of you're not missing anything but i will um <laughs> and so i don't know if you've answered this question in it but it seems to be my view that the problem with football is there's too much money in football uh, as opposed to not enough money in football it's just that that money is kind of concentrated in all the wrong places, and it's forcing teams at the bottom to stretch themselves, and, and, and you know, it's that seems to be the problem. Is there any way that that will sort itself out? That that will even itself out? That, that less money will come into the game, and that will be better for the game? Or am I completely like romanticizing that? Kind of- I, I I think that you you are you're being a bit you're being very idealistic, and yeah. I fully support <laughs> yeah, where, where you're coming from, uh, Matt, but. Uh, that there, there are two issues, uh, certainly in sort of the, but certainly the top couple of divisions. Uh, first of all, the gaps within the division are too big, uh, and secondly, the gaps between divisions are too big. So, I, I did some research. Um, I, I was talking to the all-party parliamentary group. I'm not, I'm not name dropping just for the sheer hell of it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> about the state of football finances, and it's. The top six in the Premier League get, have three times as much revenue as the bottom 14, who in turn have three times as much as clubs 
in receipt of parachute payments in the championship, who in turn have three times as much revenue as the non-parachute payment clubs in, in the championship, who in turn have three times as much money as the clubs in League One. So if you're in League One, you're going to overspend because you want to get three times as much. If you're in the bottom half of the championship, you're going to overspend to try to get into the playoffs. And get. And if, if you get into the Premier League, you're going to overspend because you don't want to lose three times uh, or you're going to lose two thirds of your income by dropping back into the championship. So it's, it's those huge gaps which encourage daft behaviour. Give us yeah. something positive to end on, Kieran. About Oldham, and um, from what you you know, what you see of it, or how you, we could maybe relate it to a similar story. So let's let's end on a positive. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm a I'm a fan of Brighton Hove Albion. In 1997 and 1998, on both of those seasons, we finished 91st in the EFL. We spent 14 years without a stadium to call our own, and now we're in the Premier League, and yeah, you know, we're we're celebrating our fourth season. It can be done. We, we, we were very, very lucky to have a fan who happened to be a billionaire take over the club. Even so, if you if, if you take a look at what's happened with, with Tranmere, uh, you know, I mentioned them, they dropped out of the league. They had big issues with ownership. They're now back. They have been as far as League One. Uh, there's a lot of people who say they should still be in League One, but you know, the way mm. that they, they were relegated seemed very, very harsh. Accrington Stanley have gone out and come back again. We've just seen Barrow come back after 40 years out of mainstream football. You know, you said that I live in Manchester. I, I lived in Stockport for 15 years. I saw Stockport go from the championship to non-league north and, and now mm. they're heading back again. So so football can still be this roller coaster. And, and what I would say to you is, is just keep the faith in the people that you surround yourselves with and don't let the owners get you down because the the owners won't be there forever. Thanks very much, Kieran, for coming on. Really Thank appreciate you, your time and your insight. Thank you. Thank Pretty you for the invite. And uh, I, I hope from, from your point of view and for all clubs that you know, we, 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 we all make progress together. After a break from league football, it's back to the league for Oldham and they have come off a 3-2 win against Hampton and Richmond. They will be looking to take this form forward as they face a struggling Scunthorpe side. Only playing 8 games this season due to many postponements, Scunthorpe have only managed to pick up 4 points, 1 win and 1 draw from their total 8 games. Scoring only 4 goals this season, they are not a very attacking side and have also conceded 17 goals, putting them on a minus 13 goal difference, showing they are a side in real trouble at the bottom of the table. Their most recent result was also in the FA Cup as they lost 3-2 to non-league Solihull Moors. This loss against Solihull Moors would make it Scunthorpe's 7th consecutive loss in all competitions. Averaging 9.4 shots per game, Scunthorpe have really struggled in front of goal and have also struggled when on the ball. With an average of 48.3% possession and 67.4% pass completion, Scunthorpe are a side that like to get the ball forward via Route 1 football. Their top goal scorer this season is a four-way tie throughout the team. Strikers Aaron Jarvis and Ryan Loft alongside midfielder Jordan Hallam and defender Jay Rowe are all sitting on one goal. Scunthorpe seem to have found a set in stone 11 as they've been playing a 4-4-1-1 in the last three games. In these games they've managed to score three goals and concede only five with one win, one draw and one loss coming from these fixtures. Their goals this season have come mainly from open play with three of the four coming from open play and one of which coming from set pieces. However, when you look at their style of attacking, it's where you see that they are a side that likes to get balls to the big men. With 42% of attacks coming down the left side and 33% coming down the right side, it's clear they like to use the wings to get the balls into the box. In terms of the busiest areas on the pitch when playing Scunthorpe, 35% of the ball is in their own third and 40% is in the middle third. They have really struggled getting forward this season and creating clear cut chances. To even further the fact that they like to get balls in the box, 57% of the shot directions are from within the middle of the goal. And of the total shots they have per game, 55% come inside the 18 yard box. With Scunthorpe struggling to score goals and to stop them, 
it's going to be a huge game for Oldham as they have scored 15 goals so far this season. With Oldham's incredible attacking play, this could be something that they could easily exploit against Scunthorpe, a side that allows 13.6 shots per game. With recent injuries, there has been worries for Oldham, but in the FA Cup game against Hampton and Richmond, they have proven that they can score goals without two key players. Zach Durney and Connor McElhinney are the side's two top goal scorers, but they are now out for an unknown length of time. With a game in the EFL Trophy against Bradford in between, Oldham might look to rest some players after having more positive tests from COVID-19. <laughs> the Bound Park Alert System is a Studio 6 production. It's hosted, edited and mixed by me, Matt Dean, and you can contact me on Twitter at Dublin OAFC. If you'd like to get in touch with us or contribute to the show, our email is bpalertsystem at gmail.com and we're on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at OAFC Podcast. If you'd like to know more about Push the Boundary, you can visit pushtheboundary.co.uk and follow them on Twitter at ptb underscore OAFC. The match stats are compiled and presented by Thomas Berry and you can follow Thomas, spelled T-O-M-O-S, on Twitter at Thomas Berry. The title music for the show is Delirio by Manchester DJ and producer Starion. You can visit redlaserrecords.bandcamp.com for more info and the latest releases. If you like the show, please do review and subscribe on whichever platform you listen. Thanks for listening. <laughs>